Tie flow basics, physics switch and shape operator explained. Enjoy. All right, so what is physics? Um, we play this little tie flow here. It's a simple setup. We got a board, some pins and three balls. Well, physics it gives us access to dynamics like physical interactions, phys physical movement of particles that's based on real world uh, dynamics and uh, physics was developed by NVIDIA and when we use a physics operator we're getting access to that NVIDIA library. So if we just kind of have a look at this, you know, basically with tie flow it's a multi-threaded physics simulation. It's kind of similar to uh, particle flow and, and M particles in uh, in 3ds Max, and it can both do rigid body and soft body dynamics. All right, um, rigid bodies retain their shape, uh, even though in um, tie flow it is possible to deform rigid bodies using techniques that Tyson shows in some of his examples. Uh, soft bodies can alter their shape and you can do soft body kind of with uh, um, physics or you can uh, also do it just using the cloth and most people will do it using the, 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 the cloth particle, right? Uh, dynamic particles. Well, any particle, for example, in, in our scenario here, the dynamic particles are the balls. So these are totally controlled by the physics engine, right? Um, and the NVIDIA library, it does all the calculations for the movements and everything like that. Uh, kinematic particles uh, can't move like dynamic particles. So they're, they're static, right? They, they don't move. Um, I mean, technically you can move them with tie flow script or something like that, but they're driven by the tie flow operators and kinematic particles will influence dynamic particles. For example, if a uh, dynamic particle collides with um, uh, a kinematic one, it'll influence that movement of the uh, dynamic particle. Deactivated particles Basically, just like the wording says, they they have been turned off, and they're not calculated by the physics engine at all, and will not influence anything. Uh, in this particular example here, um, the balls are dynamic, being calculated by physics. The pins and the board are kinematic. In other words, they don't move during uh, the duration of the animation. The reason for having in this instance three separate events for me was by having the pins separate to the board, separate to the balls, I can, I can control um, restitution, uh, dynamic and static friction separately which will all um, change how the animation looks, how much bounce do the balls have, uh, how much does the ball rotate when it touches the board versus the pins? So just by separating them into separate events, I get full control over the animation. For the sake of completeness, we'll just um, create a physics animation, right? And in this case, we would expect the ball should animate pretty decently and go back and forth several times if we say if this was a skateboard ramp and a decent ball it should actually go back and forth a few times so let's do the default uh, creation of a physics animation and all we need to do here is we birth our objects first so I've created the ramp created a ball I put them in separate events so I can control them separately and also the ramp is going to be kinematic non-moving static object the ball is going to be a dynamic physics controlled object so all we have to do now is go into hit tab and type physics shape all right and 
boom, we've turned the um, ramp into a physics shape. Now, because it's a uh, kinematic object, we want the best shape to follow it. Let's display the hole and we can see by default that ain't going to work. So we go in here and make it a mesh and we can see that using the hole, that's perfect. That's what we want. And for the ball, we do the same thing. Tab physics shape and convex would kind of work, but we're going to use, it's hard to tell with all the mesh but the ball is going to be better, the sphere, right? Now we've created a physics animation. It was that simple, but with all default settings, we play the, play the animation, and you can see it just doesn't quite look right. It is going back and forth, but it seemed rather slow. So without just making a full-on tutorial, we go over here into the main settings for tidal flow and we're going to increase the gravity a bit and say do something like minus 10 and see how that looks to give it a bit more pounce we'll play it once here and now you can see it has a little bit more speed but it seems to kind of slow down a little bit i mean this part is not bad and uh we haven't played with anything so let's say for example we wanted this to rock back and forth a lot more right we could go over here and we're covering these topics in a minute and we could try and decrease the static and dynamic friction on both the ramp and the ball but at the end of the day it will improve it but not much so every now and then you're going to have to be aware of the settings over here in the main settings for tie flow right and one of the things that we can do here is this default inertia is usually set to 10 i think by default i think and if you play it, you can see that it's kind of very unrealistic, right? And you're just going to have to every now and then play with and understand these settings, right? But, for example, if we wanted this thing to do a lot more rocking, then we could say set this to 2. And now you're going to see, depending on your animation, right? And then it'll slowly start to slow down. And we could now increase the drag here on dynamic and static friction to make it slow down even more but be aware of the main settings depending on what type of animation you're making here you may have to make some adjustments look them up in the help file and just get an idea but that's roughly how easy it was to create a physics animation now i didn't make it obvious to you uh, when i first created this but uh, i just want to reinforce that right now both of these were created by default as dynamic particles because all we did was drop the physics shape operator in there. Now, because the ramp is using the mesh hull, it's automatically uh, converted into a, a kinematic particle. But technically, the correct way for us to kind of have done this would be to be go in here and use the physics uh, switch, which is how we tell the physics system what kind of particle we want to be. Now in this case, it was fine because we used a mesh uh, uh, hull, uh, but this is how you set what kind of um, physics particle you want, dynamic, kinematic, trigger, or deactivated. All right, so here we have an example of soft body and rigid body. The soft body being these two cubes on the left that are red. They're actually a cloth bind operator. And uh, we're just touching on it because we mentioned soft bodies. Then we have four dynamic particles up the top here, which are the ones we're going to animate. They're going to be totally calculated by the physics engine. We have a deactivated particle, and if it does what it's supposed to do, it won't even be recognized by the physics engine, and we'll probably see this ball pass through this one. The floor, we've also made a particle, and we've set it to kinematic, which means it's a non-animated, non-moving uh, pa uh, physics particle, but it will influence what happens with these. I've cached the playback so we can play it, and we'll play it. And we can see 
the difference between a soft body and a rigid body. And for the purposes of these physics tutorials we're doing, we're not going to cover soft body anymore. That's a totally different subject, so we'll get rid of these unwanted items in a second. We can see that the uh, dynamic uh, sphere is passing right through the deactivated sphere, so that confirms that deactivated has no result and is invisible to the physics engine. Let's talk about hull types, what they do, and how to pick the right hull for the right uh, mesh. So we've removed the unwanted items from the scene, and what we're left with is a sphere, a complex shape, and a box. What you're seeing in this top viewport here is the green is the shape of the mesh, the white is the shape of the hull. In physics and physics dynamics, what determines how a object interacts with its environment is its hull. At the moment, they're all set to a sphere. And when we play the animation, I've got the floor on ever so slight an angle so that we can see how they're going to behave a bit better and we play it once here and we can see that all three objects behave exactly the same as the sphere on the left which actually has a perfect hole associated with it because it's exactly the shape of the particle so let's fix this cube on the right here and so we go over here to this box we go into the physics shape operator the way that we see or don't see a hole is to turn this on and off. And right now it's a sphere, so we're going to select box. And we can now see that that's a perfect fit for that particle. And when we play the animation, the box still bounces and rotates a little bit because of the angle of the floor, but it behaves more like a box, just a slightly bouncy box. So what can we do with this complex shape in the middle. If we look at the different options for hull type, obviously sphere, uh, box would work, you know, like in the sense that it would, it's a flat bottom, flat top, flat sides, but you can see here that it doesn't like follow the shape here, there's no indentation, so if something was to hit this area of the uh, object, it wouldn't penetrate in, it would actually bounce off out here where it technically should be empty space. And we'll just play the animation. You can see because it's a slightly bigger, wider box, it doesn't rotate like this one. But we need to find a better shape. Now we can try convex, which is kind of the default shape uh, that's given to the hole when you create a physics shape operator. and Convex is like shrink wrap. Like if, what's the tightest shape that can follow around this shape? It's not going to uh, fill in the hollows. It's not going to wrap itself around all these edges here, right? So in this instance, the best a convex shape could do for this shape was to kind of create, I don't know what it would be, an octagon or something like that. Uh, and when we play, I think it's still going to act a bit like a ball but not quite a ball because it does have flat edges but rounded corners there, right? So we go into this mesh operator and it's a perfect fit. Why can't we use that? Because like it says here in the operator, the mesh can only be used for kinematic objects which are non-animated, not calculated by the physics engine and that's really a bummer, right? because that's the one that fits the best. So that leaves us with this compound object. And by default, these are the settings here. And what it tries to do with this compound is it has some voxel choices, it has some sizes for those voxels, it has what's the kind of minimum amount to fill the maximum so you can play with those settings and it's going to try as best as it can to fill the shape of our um, object 
with those uh, voxels so that we can get a better kind of following of um, compound shapes. Now, in this instance, it's not really working because these spheres are sticking out the end here. They, they, we do now have access to this area of the particle, and it's, that's good. But these other spheres and single spheres are no good because if we play that animation, it's going to rock and roll. It's not flat. That's not what would happen with the flat, right? So can we improve on that? Well, yeah, we could change this voxel size. And I know from playing around it, probably about 2.7. should be pretty close. And you can see we now have lots of little spheres filling the inside space of our particle. And it's pretty damn close to our shape. And that would probably be more than an acceptable result. You can see it does roll a little tiny bit. And that would be because, you know, these spheres are round and the bounce is set. Can we improve on that? Yeah, well, one of the other choices in here is to use cubes. All right, and we can see that this is a very nice fit for our shape. And when we play it, it really truly acts like the object that it is, right? Especially with the bounce, even though this, the, the bottom is flat, it kind of rocks a little bit, but it, it's a great fit. So from this example here, we see the importance of the hull. You need to be aware of what hull you're using for each object. Find the best one that suits your object for complex shapes try and mess around with this compound, these voxels, until you get the best that you can get with the limitations of what tie flow and physics has to offer. So I hope that helps explain the importance of hulls and how to use that part of the rollout. Uh, so here we have an example of all the different hull types. All right. And uh, if we play the animation, we can see that it looks reasonably okay. I mean, you would need to make some adjustments. The walls keep moving. And, you know, so we're using a uh, sphere hull for the, the sphere. We're using a mesh hull for the tray, which gives a beautifully tight fit. All right. We're using the compound one for this uh, complex box. We're using a box for the box. All right, and we're using a convex uh, shape for the rod. So there's an example. And play to your heart's content with your holes until you get them perfect. Let's say we wanted to adjust the hole. Uh, that's where you would go into this shape dimension part of this rollout. And if we turn that on, uh, the hole for this sphere now has actually been enlarged because of whatever setting was in here, right? And now if we play the animation, the ball is actually going to behave as if the sphere is much larger than it really is, right? So you can see in this top viewport here that it's collecting on this outer uh, white uh, circle, right? And so if we make adjustments to that sphere, like do something radical, make it twice as large, right? You can see that we are... Uh, almost elevating the ball as if it has some sort of magical clear sphere around it and it's not limited to uh, going bigger we could actually go smaller 0.5 and now the sphere will actually partially sink into uh, its contact point if we go 0.1 here you can see that it's now sinking into the tray and not colliding as if we would expect. So this shape dimension here is where we would uh, play around and alter the hole if we 
find it necessary to do so. I'll turn this back off and now I'll show you a little problem that happened. I might have to talk to Tyson about this, but you can see that it did not revert back to the default settings, right? So if we ever do that by accident or on purpose and you want to revert back, there's really only two options. You delete the physics shape operator and recreate it and just select the whole mode that you wanted. Or in this instance, once we've done this now, the only real way that we can get back out of this is to go back and find an appropriate setting that is the right size for this sphere. So it's a quirk that I found while I was playing around and testing. And uh, see, even if we even if we change the shape now, like we go temporarily to box, you can see that it's smaller, whereas before it would have been tight to the outside. This is all based on this now. Uh, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, let's just take a look at restitution and mass. But So what we've got here is a scene with uh, six equal sort of sized ramps and they're all set to kinematic and then we have different size boxes here all set to dynamic the smaller boxes of this size are all the same volume and same size this one here is 2x the volume all right and this one here is just a random size the ball here is mainly so we can talk about restitution, which is essentially bounce, right? So how do things uh, bounce off each other? And that's the main kind of thing for restitution. If we we'll delete that for a minute and just load up this uh, definition here. All right, and it's basically the amount of energy each particle retains after collision. So basically for restitution setting, think of the think of it as the the bounce effect. Alright. And it can either apply to colliding particles or particle to particle or particle to object collision. But uh, you can set the restitution on both uh, um, like a dynamic and a kinematic object which we'll explain after but um, so for example in our scenario here we can set restitution on both the ball and the ground and the ramps and the boxes now restitution goes from zero to one one being the maximum and if you have maximum on both you're going to get unrealistic and unpredictable results so Let's just have a look at an example of this animation. We'll just play it. And this is fairly typical um, um, default setting, so to speak, right? And let me go back in here for a minute, delete this, and set it to clear. Like, you can see here that the box that's twice the size of the uh, other box on the left you know, it has more impact just on a... It, it's acting as if it has more impact on the collision, whereas two equally sized uh, cubes are almost behaving in identical mirrored fashion. And then you can see here just by volume, this much bigger box is having much greater impact than all the others on the uh, animation. So... If we go in and show what restitution does on um, right now on the ramp here, you can see over here on the ramp, you can see that it's uh, set to zero. But if I do something like 0.5, because it's already set to one maximum on the cubes and the ball, but now if I set the ground and the ramps to have a higher restitution value like 0.5, you can already see, A, the ball is bouncing much more. Even the objects here are actually bouncing off the ramp as they slide rather than a proper behavior. 
and you can see how now the objects are being shot even further unrealistically way over and that's only at say halfway if we do something like 0.75 for restitution on the ramps and the ground remember that the dynamic objects already have restitution set to one you can just see and at some point if we go all the way to one on both the ball and the ramp uh, at the ground we're going to get a ball that never stops bouncing so I'll set that to one now all right and you can see that essentially we get like a ball that has no gravity almost like the bounce is forever so let's do that back to zero on the ramps and the ground so now we're back to zero and we're back where we started if we now go over here on the boxes and the, the spheres on the restitution you can see if I change it to 5, 0.5 there, you can see the ball almost stops bouncing immediately and there's less of an impact on these ones. But if we go down to zero, now both the ramp and the ground have uh, zero restitution. So use the restitution value to affect the bounce. And remember that you can do it on both uh, the collider object and the colliding object. Um, let's talk mass uh, versus volume for a minute. And what is mass and what is volume? Well, mass like is equal to the density, right? The density of a uh, an object, for example, a uh, 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch piece of foam would have a lot less density to buy it than a 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch piece of granite and the granite obviously would weigh way more than the foam of equivalent size so if this was a uh, piece of a granite and this was a piece of foam or something equally lighter then this should have more impact if we were trying to animate mass and pretend that an object has mass, right? I've added these two end locations based on the default settings. So based on the default volume and mass settings, this is roughly where the boxes would end up and the position they would end in just so we can see um, and compare. So right now everything is more or less set at the uh, um, default settings and you know, volume is just the amount of space so you know volume just equals the amount of space an object takes up right so if we're only working on volume two equally sized volume should probably generate um, an equal uh, response. Um, let's delete this for a second and play the animation to frame 120. All right, and we can see based on our default settings, they do essentially add up where they, the silhouette show. So if we now change the right box, and we could play here with either mass, volume, surface area, whatever. But maybe these settings aren't so important in, in the fact that you can just fake it. So maybe you don't need to me mess with these other than keep them the same so you get the same result between the right and the left here. It's the same settings, right? So if we just override the value of one of them, let's say make the right-hand side 10 because we're trying to emulate it as being a piece of granite that's sliding. Now when we play the timeline, you can see that A, the right box slid further as if it had more mass, even though right now we're playing with the volume, right? And B, the left hand box bounced a lot further back. Now, I haven't tested this, so I don't know what happens if I send this to 100, how far can we go with 
the limited ramp uh, angle and the time they slide but you can see that we can influence it a bit more all right we could even make this left hand box lighter than what it currently is so if i went to the left hand box instead of the default one i said point one right so we're decreasing the result here and let's see what happens in the uh, timeline when we play it you can see it actually would have flown a lot further if it hadn't hit the edge of this uh, ramp so play it again you can see it hits the edge of the ramp but it definitely would have flown a lot further um, had it not hit that so that's one way that you can fake either your mass or your volume to get the kind of result like one example here would be that uh, this is a basketball and this is a uh, bowling ball right in which case um, you know this should bounce a lot further back being hit by a bowling ball and a bowling ball should roll a lot further obviously these are square boxes so they're not going to roll and move as if they were spheres but I hope that kind of explains mass versus volume and to some degree you can just play with these default values this value here to fake what it is you need to fake right and let's take another look at mass versus volume and touch on static and dynamic friction this time using spheres and uh, you know I said earlier about faking it you know, CG graphics is about creating a believable uh, visual illustration of something happening in the real world. When I said about faking it, a more correct term would be, you know, the best and easiest way to accomplish whatever the illusion is I'm trying to present. Why struggle with four or five parameters if I can create roughly the same illusion with just adjusting one? And that's obviously in reference to this using this value up here and leaving these at some sort of preset and then creating my illusion for example we'll go through it now with the just pretending like this is a um, bowling ball versus say a uh, basketball um, now right now if I play the animation you know it's kind of a repeat of the the cubes in a sense but they're traveling a bit further even though they're balls and I put the checker pattern on just so we could see if they actually look like they were rotating and let's address uh, one issue first the rotation so the reason they're not rotation is because there's no friction between the items right so for example I go to the ramp here and try and put some uh, static and dynamic friction on then when I play it we start to get a slightly more accurate thing but you can see that the animation slowed down quite a bit right so I'm not sure if this is the only way to do this, but right now the only way that I can find to speed this back up is to come over here and put um, more gravity. So if I say change that to minus 10 and now play the animation, we can see we got back to a fairly speedy kind of uh, animation, probably acceptable. And I think the balls even look like they're roughly rolling at the right kind of thing, occasionally slipping. And that was just right now by putting friction on the ramps. I didn't put it on the ball. But now let's say that we want to make this uh, right hand uh, sphere over here much heavier than this left hand one because this is the. Uh, um, this is the. Uh, um, bowling ball right heavy and this is say a basketball roughly the same physical size in the world so 
We'll try and make this heavier. So say we do something like 100 over here and see what happens in the mass override, right? Leaving the other settings at volume, we're going to use this and forget that there's five parameters here and see if we can get our result. And we play the animation. Well, yeah, that wasn't bad. You can see that this ball now has a lot more pounce to it, right? And let me say maybe try 50. See what happens with 50. And we'll play the animation. And I mean, really, that's not terrible, all right? So now I'll show a different uh, video just on how to think about static and dynamic friction. I'll set up a different scene uh, and even though they kind of perform uh, two different tasks, right, they do kind of affect each other. So, you know, we'll go through that. But I think, I mean, this is not a horrendous kind of result. All right, let's take a quick look at this static and dynamic uh, friction and try to explain that as best as we can. I've got this little ramp, tilting ramp set up with a box sitting on it. And, you know, basically static friction is the force that resists motion between uh, two non-moving surfaces. So in other words, what will it take to get that box moving from a static position? Whereas dynamic friction is friction that continues to resist the movement of that box while the box is moving. So let's play this little example once. I've turned off restitution, static and dynamic all on the plank so that when I make my adjustments, we're only looking at the setting for this box. And we play the animation once and I've got this ramp tilting up quite high and you can see that essentially when it gets up the top, it almost doesn't slide at all, it just falls, and that's because we've got the static friction set to 12, which seems to be the limit for this example. So if I now change this to 10 and play the example again, I'm reducing what it's going to take to get it started, but it's still not enough to just stop it from falling. Let's try 8 here, and play it one more time, and it started to slide, but still relatively late. We go to six. Now we will see it starting to slide at some point. And there it goes. We'll just halve this to see the difference. And that's a pretty smooth slide. We go to two and it should start sliding fairly early in the animation. So that's kind of your static friction now this dynamic will also affect they kind of work together in a way or against each other in a way and maybe only a minute uh, movement will trigger this dynamic but if we say set this dynamic to say 0.6 instead of 0.2 here play the animation now it should once it starts sliding it should be a slower slide right and if we go to one and play it again you'll see that it it's resisting the slide by changing this dynamic. So, but again, like I said, the two um, work in conjunction with each other. One thing that I should mention in my testing, if we go in here to the tie flow settings and we go here to the, the frame steps, the, for this kind of animation, I actually found it to be more useful to have a smaller time step for example, if we increase the time step to something like 1 8th and play the animation, you're going to see jittering. So it actually causes the animation to not look as good. It's like somehow even this box shouldn't be vibrating. Increasing the number of times the animation is calculated actually produces a, an adverse effect. So for an animation like this, if you seem to be getting uncontrollable bouncing, Maybe you're better off going down to a lower time step. And now you can see that the animation is more or less behaving 
how it should behave. I'll just reduce this static friction a little bit less and play it one last time. And there you go. Uh, we've covered a lot of parameters, but let's quickly touch on this X, Y, and Z position and rotation. I think they're fairly explanatory. Like, obviously, if you lock the position for X, Y, or Z, you're going to prevent that movement. And, you know, that's something that really needs to be thought about if you're doing a physics simulation because it should be controlled by the dynamics of what's going on. But, you know, there are cases where you want to do this, even if you want to kind of, in some essence, turn a dynamic particle into a kinematic one and lock it in this position. But here's a practical example. What's supposed to happen here if we play the animation is uh, the ball is supposed to come down, hit turn the lever one way and then another ball hits and turns another way and it's some testing for a uh, directional kind of change direction thing for a marble game that I'm working on and I, I had problems uh, it's actually quite a bit of a mind messer with to try and make this um, dynamic particle but we'll explain all that or show some of this when we do further tutorials on this so sticking with our original problem, everything works fine. The marbles come down, hit the thing, cause the, the lever to work in both directions. But when we look at it more closely, we see that we're getting some unwanted movement on the lever. It's tilting up this way. It's twisting a little bit. We really only want it to stick to moving very, as best as it can, up and down and not twisting and see it the wobble there you can see this end is now sticking up this one's penetrated down into the board so in this example if I lock the X and Y here I'm going to get much cleaner animation of this lever all right it's not going to quite bounce around as much as it did and right now there's a little bit of sl slop it's not a tight fit for this pin so I can also improve this by improving the gap. Now, I hope that gives at least maybe a possible practical example of the usage of these. Um, anyway, let's move on. Uh, let's just quickly revisit this uh, earlier example of a dynamic lever. Now, Right now, it's having a crazy motion explosion. If you can see in this viewport here, you can see that the lever just is, cannot contain itself and eventually it's going to eject itself from the object that it's supposed to be uh, working within its constraints, right? Uh, and it, you can see it's very radical movement. Now, you can get even more crazy motion explosions if somehow you you know, turn two particles into dynamic at the same time, one is inside the other, right? But simply speaking, what the problem is here, and I've purposely done it, is this pin is way too big for the hole. I've set it to 10 when it should really be set to about 7-ish, uh, right? So we get the pin right much closer to the hole size, and now it's not going to eject itself or anything like that so just be aware that sometimes you know if your object is way too big and is actually um, penetrating into the dynamic object you can see it's doing everything possibly it can to get itself away from this pin right and eventually it's just going to not behave in any kind of physics manner and just penetrate through the wall and eject itself so just watch how you construct things let's revisit this ball and ramp scene for talk on damping uh, damping is slowing down an object over time each time it'll add some damping and then progressively slow it down so we play our original animation it kind of keeps going and going and going and we understood earlier that we can play with this inertia multiplier 
uh, on velocity limits I haven't had much luck playing with these so I generally leave them alone if I bring them down too low then the dynamic object just seems to pass through the kinematic objects now on the ramp if we play with the um, damping so we'll do something crazy like two and two this is on the ramp right and we're not going to see much effect it slows it down a little bit but it still keeps rocking back and forth and this is not what we might have expected trying to play with the damping so this is a case of where whether you apply it to the ball or ramp is going to make a difference so if we come over here uh, on the ball and say I increase both of those to two all right and you can play around with which one you know angle is when it kind of hits on an angular surface and linear is when it's actually traveling in a straight line direction back and forth but if we play it now you can see that was a lot of dampening and the ball really came to a stop quick and just now play with the settings to kind of fine tune it right maybe one works better here but you can see there was quite a huge difference between playing with the dampening on the ball versus the damping on the ramp. Have lots of fun and play to your heart's content. All right, so earlier I was playing with making an, a, a marble game kind of animation, and it turned out to be more complex. Um, we'll go through more of this stuff and actually make some sort of demo project eventually, but you know, we have the physics bind, the physics break, and the collision and the uh, modify operators to go through in separate tutorials but let me just tell you that physics can be a little bit quirky it's not like absolute plug and play you're going to get some weird stuff happen that you have to solve and I'll just show you uh, this particular problem everything appears to be animating perfectly right now for this particular track design seems to be speeding up where it's supposed to be speeding up, seems to be slowing down where it's supposed to slow down. The ball seems to be spinning at the appropriate speed. Now, for some reason, I have a strange problem with this 180 degree bend. So I had to break this 180 degree bend into its own event so that I can control uh, static and dynamic friction separately and that's kind of how we control the ball uh, looking like it's spinning and rotating and also the speed at which it does that on the track. If, I, if you look at the settings for the rest of the track for static and dynamic friction, that's my settings there, it works awesome. But if I put this 180 degree bend back to say roughly that, we'll do 0.2, you're going to see a real weird event happen here. The ball is going to come to a screeching halt and spin. And it has just enough angle that it would actually keep going if the timeline was longer, right? It would slowly, but this is just an unrealistic result. And so I try something like 0.5, it gets better. Uh, but it's still, you know, if this marble was real and it was in a real world, this thing should almost be zipping around this 180 degree bend. So at the end of the day, I'll do one. It starts to become a, a reasonable, right? You'll see here. And ultimately, I settled on 1.5. Now, you can't just keep endlessly going with that number if... I set that dynamic friction to 2 instead of going around the corner it's actually going to shoot off the end here I can show you that just I can show you that just for completeness you'll see that it's actually not going to stay on the track it's going to shoot off the end so I think what I'm trying to tell you is physics is going to require some playtime it's going to require some understanding time and sometimes it's just going to require you keep playing with settings, even the ball size, the track, those kind of things uh, to get the animation look that you want. I think we're going to leave it here for this tutorial. 
and you know, there's going to be several more parts and eventually you will play around with making a few um, dynamic simulations like this one maybe a bucket elevator different things but see you in the next tutorial